Well, good morning, everyone. Here we are on a very special day, the day that God's called out his first fruits. And the subject today I want to talk about is the day we're here celebrating is the day of Pentecost. But I want to talk about it today in a little different fashion. I want to talk about how important it is for you and I, and I'm going to talk about the qualification process of what God requires all those who are being called in this first life to be a part of his kingdom when he comes. Pentecost is not a single event. Now, some people believe it is. Most professing Christians in the world believe that Pentecost came, and it's from a misunderstanding found in the book of Acts, which says when, when Pentecost was fully come, believing that the day of Pentecost was completed, it was fulfilled, it was a one-time act, and it was done. However, God's Holy Word shows us that it's not. It is an actual process of those who are being called in this life for, for the time of 7,000 years of man. Pentecost is a New Testament term. If you went through the Bible and you looked under a concordance and you tried to find Pentecost, you would not find it anywhere in the Old Testament. It is a Greek word which means 50 or 50th. Now, if we're going to understand Pentecost, understand the meaning or the 50th or the 50th day, we need to understand three very important things. First, we need to understand its origination, where God began to talk about what we understand as the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament and how it applied to the nation of Israel. Two, we need to understand its meaning. If we are here observing a particular day, which points to something yet to be completely fulfilled in the future, we need to understand what that meaning truly is. And third, we need to understand how does it apply to me personally, or to you personally. The personal application for Pentecost. So as we go through this message today, you're going to see that Pentecost is not simply a single day event that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost at the birth of the New Testament church back at the time of, of Christ right after his resurrection. Now, let's go through a couple of misunderstandings first to explain where these misunderstandings come from so we can understand what we're talking about today. First, it is not a single event. Pentecost is a process. Most proficient Christians today believe that this is the day that they became born again. All right, born again. That's a term we hear all the time. You'll talk to uh, someone on the street who's professing Jesus Christ, and one of the first things they'll ask you, are you born again? And if you tell them you're not born again, of course, the first thing they do, they want to try to save you, thinking that you're, that you're lost, that you're not born yet again. Second misunderstanding is that most professing Christians believe that God gave his spirit fully, that today, that if you're born again, you have all of God's Holy Spirit, and that you are a born-again Christian, and you die, you're resurrected to uh, go to heaven at, at the moment that you die. Now, let's go through these two, and let's, let's see if we can explain the Bible actually does say. So if we can show how those two misunderstandings don't apply, then we can actually get into what the Bible does say. First, let's, let's talk about being born again. And what's, what does the Bible have to say about that? So let's get it right from Jesus' own words. All right. Jesus answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you. Now he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee. And he came to Jesus Christ and he was asking about being born again. Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, so that's why, hence, people today believe that when they accept Jesus Christ, that revelation, that they are born again in the flesh, in blood, and that they're going to see the kingdom when they die because of this scripture. Now, that's found in John 3, 3. Please write these things down back and look them up yourself. Prove these things for yourself. Take anyone's word and let the Bible interpret this. In fact, you might want to go through the entire uh, third chapter of John and it explains the whole little story and the scenario of what Jesus Christ is talking about. Now, he went on to say just a couple verses later, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, let me ask you something. 
if you're born of the flesh, you're flesh. Can you be born of the spirit and still be in flesh? Well, absolutely not. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when some come, someone comes to you and says, are you born again? What they're asking is that, are you living in the spirit now? And Jesus Christ, from his own word, says that if you're born in flesh, take anyone's word and let the Bible interpret this. In fact, you might want to go through the entire uh, third chapter of John and it explains the whole little story and the scenario of what Jesus Christ is talking about. Now, he went on to say just a couple verses later, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, let me ask you something. If you're born of the flesh, you're flesh. Can you be born of the spirit and still be in flesh? Well, absolutely not. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when some come, someone comes to you and says, are you born again? What they're asking is that, are you living in the spirit now? And Jesus Christ, from his own words, says that if you're born in flesh, you're all flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That means everybody walking around today is in the flesh. You are born of the flesh. You're not born of the spirit. Now that's, that's from Jesus' own words. Now, if you, if you might have heard a minister tell you about take the old hat pin test, that if you could pull a hat pin and stick it in your arm somewhere and you hurt and you bleed, then you're still flesh and blood. And that puts it to anything that, any doubt that you might be in the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say, just a few more verses down, and no one has ascended to heaven but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. Which brings another doubt that when you die, you're not going to heaven yet. All right, so that's the first misunderstanding, which Jesus Christ says, if you're in the flesh, you cannot be born again of the Spirit. And that's what Nicodemus was asking. And you can go back and read that for yourselves. The second misunderstanding I want to talk about, it's about the Holy Spirit was fully given. Now, you can go along the highways and the byways, and you'll look out and you will see full gospel, full spirit, and you will see Pentecostal movements, that are taking place all over the world. You'll see tens of thousands of people in churches all across the country believing they have the full spirit. That if you don't have the full spirit, then you're not yet in God's care. But look what the Bible says about this. Now, this is another misunderstanding from the day of Pentecost. And it comes from the wording of when the day of Pentecost was fully come, misunderstanding, thinking that it was the full amount of God's Holy Spirit. Now look what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. Who has sealed us, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of his spirit. Now let me, let me read that again. Who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. Now what is an earnest? It's a down payment. If you were buying a home and in your, in the, the um, Realtor will come to you and say, listen, we need to have some earnest money up front. Now, we need to know that you're serious, that you really want to buy this house. We want to seal the sale, give us an earnest or a down payment, seals the sale, no one else can take it. Now, what God's telling us, right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, is that he has given us a down payment of his Holy Spirit. Does that sound like he's given us all of his spirit? No, he's given us the down payment. It's an earnest of what's going to come later on, seals us, promises us that he, is, he has bought us, he has taken care of us, and that when he returns, that you and I will be his when he comes. Now, in earnest, if you would actually look in the concordance and try to find what that Greek word means, it means down payment or pledge. So God, from his holy word, is telling us that when you've been called, you receive the Holy Spirit, from baptism after repentance, then you have a pledge from God that he's going to come back and claim what is his. When? At the return of Jesus Christ for all those who have been called in the first, <clears throat> as the part of the first resurrection. He goes on to say in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verses 13 to 14, in whom also after you believed you were sealed, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest, and there's that word again, which is the down payment of our inheritance. If you had a child, and the child had an inheritance, and he needed a little bit to tide him over, maybe for college or something, 
then you would take a little bit of that inheritance money that he's going to get later on, and then you will apply it or give it to him, a down payment to give him what he needs now to get him through the times he was in to, until the time of his inheritance comes. And that's what, the, that's what the Bible's telling us here, is that Jesus Christ has called you and I. We are called by the Father, put in Jesus' care. John 6, 43 tells us that, 43, 44. You can read that whole little scenario there. That we have been called by the Father, placed in Jesus' care, and at the time of repentance, being baptized, and it says, by the laying on of hands, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. At that particular time, we are sealed. We are sealed. We are given a down payment of his Holy Spirit in us, so that he can dwell in us and lead and guide us. That is the earnest, the down payment of, his, of our inheritance of what he promises he's going to give us when he returns. Now, that's from your own Bible. The inheritance until when? The redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And that is the time of Jesus Christ at his return. And you go back and read that for yourself again, Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. Pentecost. All right. Let's talk about the origination. Where, where did God begin talking about the process of what we understand today as Pentecost? The, the holy day by the name Pentecost was not known to the ancient Israelites. They knew it by various other names. Now, if you go back and you look into the Old Testament, and I typed in the concordance, uh, I was online, and I said Pentecost. It brings me to the New Testament. You will not find it anywhere written in the Old Testament. However, the Old Testament, ancient Israel, did observe this special holy day designed by God, but they knew it under other names. They knew it as first fruits. They knew it as feast of weeks. And they knew it as the spring harvest. And I'm not going to go into Leviticus 23 now, but if you would, make a little note in your, in your notes. Go back, or you can pause the DVD, Go into Leviticus 23, and you will find all God's holy days listed there, including the day that we understand as Pentecost. But if you look in the Old Testament, and you see them talking about the Feast of Weeks or the early harvest or spring harvest or first fruit, you understand that they're talking about what we understand today as the day of Pentecost. Now, let's talk about the meaning. All right, let's talk about the meaning of Pentecost because this is very important. It's referred to as the spring harvest or it's also called the early harvest. There were two harvest seasons each year in, in Israel, the earlier or smaller harvest, which we understand today as Pentecost. There was also a later harvest, which was also referred to as the fall harvest or the feast of ingathering, sometimes called Feast of Tabernacles. That is the later harvest, which was a much larger harvest at the, at the end of the growing season, at the end of the summer, before they actually went into winter. And that harvest would actually carry them through the winter months until the spring harvest was ready. And those are the two harvest seasons. Now, we're going to talk about the early season or the spring harvest, Pentecost. The story actually begins in Exodus chapter 19. All right, Exodus chapter 9, 19. Now, this is, this is following Israel, had been, who had been captured in Egypt and slaves in Egypt. They had been there for 430 years, as God says, to the very self-same day. God had called them out of Egypt. They had traveled to Mount Sinai. And if you begin reading in Exodus 19, verse 1, it says, on the, In the third month, on the first day of the month, the very self-same day, they come to that land at the foot of Mount Sinai. So now we want to pick up the story in chapter 19. This is the instruction for beginning to keep not the Feast of Weeks. It begins a covenant relationship. Now this is the process I'm talking to you about. Is that Pentecost to be a part of, to have a part of the return of Christ, the fulfillment, to have earnest, the down payment given to you, you must first enter into a covenant relationship or a contract with God. Now, you may not realize that, but it's actually no different for us today than it was for them in the Old Testament. 
excepting for that we do it through baptism rather than the circumcision in the agreement with God. Now, God was beginning that covenant relationship at Mount Sinai. All right, now I'm going to go through that right here. Let's, let's take, just talk about that just for a little bit. The information given to Israel was to establish the covenant relationship with the eternal. Now, if you go into Exodus 19, and what you'll see is that God begins talking to Moses. He calls him up to the mountain. He says, now listen, this is what I want to do with the children of Israel. Go down and tell them. Moses takes the information and the instructions. He goes down to the Israelites. He says, this is what God says. And all the people says, yes, we will do it. Go, Moses goes back up to the mountain. Right, God gives him a little more instruction. And he did this two or three times. And when the children had accepted the, the agreement or the covenant, God tells them, be ready in three days. He says, and I will give you the law. And that would begin the relationship that they would, they would fulfill for eternity. This was a national covenant. This covenant was made to the nation of Israel. Each one did their part personally within that covenant. The New Testament covenant is a personal relationship because all are be called Israelites through the spirit, through, through the uh, setting aside, the cutting off of sin in our lives, accepting Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior, and from that time on, you are a part of that first calling at the return of Jesus Christ. The instruction for what God was commanding them to do year after year, the observance of Pentecost, as we understand, wasn't yet given here. At Mount Sinai, what was given was the guidelines, the establishment, or the qualification to become a part of God's kingdom. Right? Well, you understand what I'm talking about here. In other words, everyone is not given the opportunity or doesn't qualify in this life to be part of that first resurrection. Now that is peculiar because a lot of people don't understand that. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and you read that Jesus Christ, when he returns, those that are called in this life will be resurrected. And it goes on to tell us, each in his own order, those that are Christ at his coming. Revelation 20 talks about, blessed and holy is he who has fought in the first resurrection. And we understand that there's more than one resurrection. Not everyone is being called. That's why this is the smaller harvest. The harvest is picturing the time when God is harvesting his family. An earlier harvest, a first harvest, is what the spring harvest represents, which is Pentecost. The first fruits are being called at this time to be a part of a work, to be with Jesus Christ, to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years on this. All right, let's go on now. God establishes his covenant. Exodus 19 and verse 14. Now, you, I want you to try to picture now the setting. There they are at the foot of the mountain. God begins to talk to them himself. Remember the, it was so loud. There was thunderings. There was lightnings. The people were scared. And eventually they told Moses, Moses, you talk to us. You know, we can't deal with God talking to us anymore because they were scared of what was going on. Let's pick up the, uh, uh, the words now of what was going on here. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes said unto the people, be ready against the third day and come not at your wives. Because God was going to come down and he's going to talk to them in three days. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. And imagine me trying to talk to them. And hear the lightning, how loud it's getting. And the people at the foot of the mountain, and that's what they were hearing, this thunder and lightning. And it was getting louder and louder. And it said, and there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet was exceedingly loud. So that all the people in the camp trembled. Now try to imagine. I was with you. a hard time hearing me. Getting a little loud. That's what was going on when the people were standing at the foot of the mountain. And the people trembled. They were frightened from what they were seeing. I remember taking some Boy Scouts out with the uh, World Watch Out Church of God back in the, in the mid-70s. And we were in a camp out. And one of the days there was... 
this massive storm come sat right on top of us. And there was thunder and there was lightning. Now, I don't know how long it went on, but it seemed like forever. And when that lightning and the thunder would go off, the ground was shaken. And all these kids was in these little bitty pup tents all scattered all around this, this campsite. And you can hear the, the, the crying and the, people, the kids squealing. Nobody got hurt, thank goodness. But you hear that lightning and the thunder going off and it would, the ground would rumble. And uh, give, give you a little bit of an idea. So if you had been anywhere near uh, a thunderstorm, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, there they were underneath all that. Now, I want to show you just a little bit what maybe the people might have felt like when they were standing there watching what was going on on the top of that mountain. Try to imagine when all the sound going off, this huge voice Remember going the off. Day. Only imagine what the voice of God must have sounded like. But let's go on. Let's go on. I just wanted to throw that in there just to kind of give you an idea. To, uh, sometimes that we, we don't picture things the way they're actually going on, but that's the, what the Bible's trying to tell us, what was going on there. It goes on to tell us, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at, at the near the part of the mountain, which was just the, the foot of the mountain. And if you go back and you read the instructions, that Mo Moses had to rope off a section where God said, tell them, don't go beyond any further than this point. And they were able to head to stay beyond that, that uh, roping off. And Mount Sinai was all together on the smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in a fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. So you can see what was taking place on that particular day, which is a type. All right, this is the forerunner. And if you look at the typology of time, you will see that this is the exact same day as we understand the day of Pentecost when God came to them with the cloven fire and it was like an earthquake and the building was shaken and everybody spoke in tongues. Well, this was the forerunner of them receiving the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, which is the down payment wasn't the fully amount of God's Holy Spirit, just the earnest or the down payment. So the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed loud, and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. So you got the thunder, you got the lightning, you got the smoke coming down, the ground shaking, fire everywhere on the top of the mountain, and the trumpets are blowing louder and louder, and finally then God begins to speak to them. Man, this, this is uh, an incredible scene that God's portraying here for us for, to try to understand what's taking place when he began this covenant relationship with Israel. The instructions for keeping the Feast of First Fruits is found in Leviticus 23. Let's just briefly cover what these instructions were because it, it defines a little bit more about the time frame that God was talking to uh, you and I to understand about the return of Jesus Christ. It begins in verse 10. Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them that when you are come unto the land which I give unto you and you shall reap the harvest thereof. The instructions were given that when they go into the promised land, and that wouldn't be for another 40 years. So the children of Israel could not even keep this day, even in its instruction point, for at least 40 years. Not until after their first harvest when they were in the promised land. And as we know, because of the disobedience to the, of the children of Israel, they were not allowed to go into the promised land for 40 years. And even so, only those who were 20 years and younger were allowed to go in except Joshua and Caleb. All the rest died in the wilderness because of their disobedience. That's a warning now to understand through the qualification process. Even though Israel was called to go to the promised land, they disqualified themselves. Now there's a warning there because you see this is duality. You and I Anyone hearing this DVD needs to understand that if you're being called, you have the opportunity to be a part of that first resurrection, to be with Christ in his kingdom. Also be disqualified. No different than the children of Israel in the Old Testament. It says, then you shall bring a sheave of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. Now when is the morrow after the Sabbath? Sunday. 
It's always the first day of the week. You always begin your counting the first day of the week. From the morrow after the Sabbath, the day that you brought the wave sheath or seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So if I began counting, when do I count? Inclusive of, and, and we go into a little more detail in the uh, uh, Pentecost Bible study. If you begin counting inclusive of the two holy days, of days of unleavened bread, inclusive on the morrow after the Sabbath, inside those two holy days, you count seven Sabbaths complete, which is 49 days. It says seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you number 50 days. If you start counting on the morrow after the Sabbath, you finish counting on a Sabbath, you Tomorrow after the Sabbath, you will always be. And this is the only day, by the way, that falls on the same day of the week every single year. All right? Number 50, which is the term Pentecost. Now, that's the instruction that was given. That was given later from Mount Sinai. It wasn't given at the time that the Ten Commandments were given. Now, let's give you a little calendar now of uh, what God was telling us from those instructions. You have week one, week two, and you go all the way through, you have the seven weeks. Remember, God says you shall count seven Sabbaths. So you have seven full weeks. That, that completes the term, the seven after the seventh Sabbath. A completion of 49 days we have at the completion of the, of the seventh Sabbath. It says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, which means 50th, which is the day of Pentecost, or the term 50th. Now, that is the Feast of Weeks. That's why it's called Feast of Weeks. So if you have one Sabbath, two Sabbaths, and you go all the way through the seven Sabbaths, you have actually seven weeks that have transpired, which is another term for Feast of Weeks. And because it was not as much harvested at that particular time, it is also the small harvest. Now, that also shows us that God has given us 7,000 years, each week 1,000 years for man's allotted time on this earth. 1,000, 2,000. If you look at the calendar here, you will go all the way through and you will see 7,000 years. We know on the 7,000th year, which is right at our doorstep, Jesus real Christ will return at the beginning, at the sound of the seventh trump. Those that have been called during those first 6,000 years, which is a smaller harvest. So if you look around today, the message I'm giving you today is not heard by the majority of the professing world. In fact, when you try to share it with them, most of the people want to reject it. Those that God has called, prick the conscience, begin to say, wait a minute now. Some of the things that I'm being taught every Sunday don't seem to fit with the Bible. In all probability, God is beginning to put that seed to open their mind and may have the opportunity to be a part in that first resurrection. If you're hearing this DVD, this, this sermon, uh, we hope to make it a Bible study by next year then you may be given that opportunity right now because this message is foreign to the majority of the world. And they reject it. And the Bible's clear about what it says. So mankind has been given 7,000 years before the actual time of the Pentecost, which is also tied into a jubilee, a year of release, a year of freedom when everything's given back to its rightful owner, which we don't have time here, but we'll cover in, in another message about the Jubilee, because it is a direct correlation to the 50th. It's a time of, of release for all mankind. It says the wave sheath. They would begin to counting from the time they brought forth the wave sheath. And here's what it says in verse 11. We're back in Leviticus 23. And he shall wave the sheath before the Lord to be accepted on the morrow after the Sabbath shall the priest wave it. The Passover week, let's talk about when that was done. During the Passover week, we have, well, I began putting by Sunday, and I'll finish with Sunday, which is, which is actually eight days for the Passover week. We know that Jesus Christ was crucified in the midst of the week. Daniel 11 tells us that, that he'd be cut off in the midst of the week. So we know Jesus Christ was crucified on a Wednesday afternoon, taken down off the stake, and buried just before sunset Wednesday. The crucifixion of Eve was buried, laid in a tomb for three days and three nights. He was resurrected Saturday evening, which is what I've shown you here with the little arrow, and became the wave sheath for us when? 
on the morrow after the Sabbath, which is on Sunday morning. Remember when Jesus Christ was walking around. Mary came to him while he was yet at the tomb. Remember? It was still dark. Remember that? He says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. The wave sheath had not yet been waved or accepted for anyone yet. Jesus Christ was still on this earth Sunday morning. It's still dark. He has already been resurrected. He wasn't resurrected at sunrise, as the world is trying to tell us. He was already on the earth. He had been resurrected Saturday evening, and he was simply waiting for that wave sheath to be cut to be accepted for us on our behalf on the morrow after the Sabbath day. Jesus Christ is our wave sheath. Now, let's, let's see if I can give you a little bit of an explanation of what took place there. It began during the Passover season that they would begin to mark and to secure whatever field they were that they were going to use that they selected to be offered for the wave sheath. The priest would go out into the field during the growing season. They would find what they would believe to be the finest area of, of, uh, of the harvest, the richest grain, uh, the, the most beautiful uh, bouquet of, of the, uh, the harvest that was going to be harvested. What they do is they would go out on Saturday evening about the time that Jesus Christ had been resurrected. There would just be this great procession. They would, they would be with the high priest and they had musical instruments and they would it'd be like a parade going out to the field. They would get to the selected field and they would take of that field the selected section, then they would rope it. They would set it, se section it off and that would be what they would use as their wave sheath to be cut the next day. That was done at the conclusion of the Sabbath day. Then they would all go back inside. And then the very next morning, what they would do on Sunday morning at sunrise, they would be back out into the field. While it was yet dark, they'd have this procession going out back into this field where they had marked off the grain. And there'd be the musical instruments, and they'd have, they'd have priests upon the mountainsides. And they'd be watched so that when the sun broke, they would call back and it would be relayed back to the priest who was at the field and they would say that it was daylight, or whatever term that they would use back then. And at the time that the sun broke, they were told the high priest would cut that wave sheath. And that was the very precise moment that Jesus Christ was resurrected to God the Father, where he was crowned King of Kings, Lord of Lords, where he sits today at the right hand of God the Father on our behalf, as the wave sheath offered as a sacrifice for us to be accepted so that you and I do not have to die. It was quite an event, and it was done every year. If you would like to know more, if, you, if you've not studied about this subject, we've got a Bible study called Feast of First Fruits: Who Are the Spiritual Israelites? And you need to write for it. It goes into detail some of the things I just explained to you real briefly about who are spiritual Israelites and your calling as part of God's first fruits to be resurrected in this lifetime. Let me just give you a little brief duality, just because just, there's a lot here, but I just don't have the time to go into it. But I want to just give you a couple of things to think about. In the Old Testament, God established his covenant with Israelites at the mount, on Mount Sinai. That's when he gave them the Ten Commandments. That's when they went back, Moses up and down. He said, yes, we will. In other words, they entered a relationship, a pact. They made an agreement with God. God said, I will do my part if you will do yours. It's a qualification. You and I have been called in this lifetime. We will also have to be qualified. The law was written in stone to live day by day, and that is known as the day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, it was not known by that day. Today, God establishes covenant with us at baptism. When God called us out of our spiritual Egypt, out of sin, the immorality of this world, he brings us to his mount, to his throne, to Jesus Christ. He establishes a covenant relationship. That he gives us his holy word. We go through it and we read what he says, what we need to live by. Realize what sin is, how we have to repent 
of things that we're doing wrong. How we need to overcome our own lives and our, our faults of this to accept him and allow him to import his spirit in us so that he can do his part. Our covenant relationship with God is established. It is sealed at baptism by the earnest of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. Our covenant relationship with God is no different than theirs was in the Old Testament. Theirs was more of a national covenant. Today, ours is a personal covenant, one-on-one. -on -one. Salvation is not dependent on anyone else. It's not dependent on your wife, your husband, your children, your mom, your dad. It's between you and God alone, and no one can take it away from you. God calls those in this life that he believes will make it into his kingdom. The law today is not done away with, as the world tries to tell us. Some people will tell you that the law was done away at Pentecost. However, the New Testament, if you go through, Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You go into Revelation, he says he's going to resurrect those who have the law, the statutes, and the judgments. The law has not been done away with. It's been magnified and written in our hearts. The law is, is, is a living law, and it will be here until the day of Christ and long after. It's an eternal law established to bring about good things for you and I. If you'd like to know a little bit more, we have another Bible study. It's called, Has Time Been Lost? It talks about the reestablishment of God's calendar in his holy days, and it brings us up to Mount Sinai. And you'll go through a step-by-step -step explanation of God's holy days and how it is established by his Sabbath day. It's an excellent study, and, and I, I highly encourage you, if you haven't got it yet, write for it. And, and I believe you really will get something out of it, and it should open your eyes to things you have never seen before. If you, especially if you're a new, new person being called at this particular time. Now, the understanding in the two, two harvests. First harvest, first resurrection. I've talked a little bit about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But, now here's the important thing that the world just does not understand. Every man in his own order now, I referred to this earlier in the sermon. Now, I'm giving you the scripture. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are his at his coming. Now, if there's some that are his, there's got to be those who are not his at his coming. Look around the rest of the world. There's religions of every, <laughs> more religions you can, you can name. Christianity is not the largest of the religions, by the way. Uh, the Buddhists, the Hindu, the Muslims, I mean, all of them are bigger than Christianity. Jesus Christ says those that are his, Christians, those are believers of Jesus Christ, at his coming. So that would have to indicate that would be someone, as we, read, as we mentioned in Revelation 20, that those would be resurrected after the thousand years or the second resurrection. Verse uh, Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. If there's a first, then there's got to be a second. At least a second. How about a third? The Bible talks about that. Go back into Revelation 20 and you begin to read and that there's more than one resurrection. Now, there's a question. Let me ask everybody. If everyone is in heaven today or hell, who is Christ coming back to resurrect? Now, that's a question. Now, that's a study in itself. You need to understand that, that if you die and you go to heaven immediately and you are Christ, who is he coming back to resurrect? Did he not know you're up in heaven with him already? All right, let me go on. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain unto now. Now, we're in the book of Romans chapter 8. And not only they, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is the down payment on what God's been giving us. The first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves waiting for the adoption, that is the redemption of our body. See, we're not born again yet. We're begotten. When God gives us that Holy Spirit, it is a seed, his living spirit in us, which is the down payment. Now, this is what Christ was talking about to Nicodemus. If you're born of flesh, you're flesh. A woman who's carrying a child. She's, she's a mother, carries the baby inside her. Is that child alive? Absolutely. Is it born yet? No. 
It is begotten inside of her. Jesus Christ uses the analogy that the Holy Spirit inside of us, we are begotten children of God to be born waiting for the redemption of our body that when you and I are born of the Spirit, that we are no longer flesh and blood. Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We are born again at the return of Jesus Christ when we have the redemption of our bodies becoming spirit beings. Personal application, our calling. Now this is probably one of the most important matters that any believer can ever understand is that you need to know about your calling. God only calls those, and this is the most encouraging thing that I can express during this sermon, is this. God only calls those he knows can overcome in this life. Isn't that remarkable? God, if, you, if you're coming to this understanding, and God is opening your mind and saying, wait a minute, the world's teaching me things that's not scripturally sound here, and you're learning things that the Holy Spirit is bringing you to understand, God has given you the opportunity. Now look what he says when he gives you that opportunity in Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun this good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How, how promising is that? Is that when God calls you and I, he's only going to call those he knows can overcome this lifetime. Because you and I are given the opportunity now. You don't get a second chance. He's not going to call someone in this life, if he doesn't believe they can make it, to destroy them. It is his goal to bring everyone into his kingdom. What an opportunity God's given you and I. He goes on to say now in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise. It's interesting when you go back and you read in the uh, four gospel accounts. They're talking about the apostles who were called. And the, the learned, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the educated of the world at the time talking with the, the apostles saying, who are these people? Aren't these unlearned? They thought they were uneducated. They were ignorant people. They were fishermen. They were just laborers that God had called through Jesus Christ. And the, and the Pharisees who had all the education says, who are these people? Where do they get this information? Aren't these unlearned men? God's telling us he has called the foolish or chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound those which are mighty. The knowledge that God's sharing with you and I of the opportunity in this life is totally foreign to the rest of the world. Those who have done real well most, in most cases, they don't want God. They don't need God in their lives and they believe they've done it on their own. And they look at this as foolish and, and it's, it's, it's something that is a farce. It doesn't exist. It's not real to them. <sighs> running our race. Once you've been called, Paul likens the calling to running a race. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 will begin there. It says, Know you that they who run a race run all, but only one receives the prize. And we know that. We, the Olympics are coming up this summer over in China, under much controversy, by the way. Everyone who runs, there's only one winner. They don't get the tie. Paul's saying that so that you run that you may obtain. Now, he likens your calling to a race. Everybody gets in and they run to, run to win the prize. There can only be one. Paul says you need to run so that you can obtain it. But he goes on to say it's something different than that. He says every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. In other words, they're running to get a crown. They want to, you know, that, that gold medal in the Olympics. But Paul's saying we are running to receive an incorruptible crown, something that will never die, that will never fade, that will never wear out. It is an eternal crown or an eternal opportunity that God is giving to you and I. Every man that strives for the mastery and is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I'll put it back in there a second time to understand this, is that 
when you run, your competition isn't against the person sitting next to you. It isn't against your mate. It isn't against anyone else on this, on this earth. You are in a race. Your goal is to be able to run that race until the day you die so that you have eternity. Everyone wins if you make it to the end. You can be disqualified, just like the children of Israel who were brought into the wilderness. They disqualified themselves because they didn't trust God. God's going to bring you through challenges in this life and through opportunities that you're going to have to overcome. But he wants you to focus on that run. You don't look around. You don't look beside. You don't see how well someone else is doing. You're compared between you and Jesus Christ, and that is your opportunity. That's what you look at, the mastery, to overcome yourself, not your neighbor or anyone else, not to judge one another, but to overcome yourself. You compare yourself to Jesus Christ, and you will find that you'll always come short. I, therefore, Paul goes on to say, so run, not as uncertainty. Paul was fixed. He was focused. And that's when a calling is. You see the crown. You're running your race. You don't take your eye off that opportunity. You know where you're going. Paul was saying, so therefore I run. Not as uncertainly. So fight I. Not as one who beats the air. It's not like a guy just punching in the air. I mean, he's focused. He knows exactly where he's going. But I keep my body lest by any means when I have preached to others. I myself should be a castaway, or another say, I would be disqualified. Paul knew what he had to do, that he had to overcome himself, to keep himself into subjection. You know, it's really easy, and I've covered that in sermons in the past, to look at someone else and see their faults. It's easy for someone else to look at me and see my faults. It's hard sometimes for us to recognize who we are because the heart's deceitful. We deceive ourselves and we don't admit what we are. But that Holy Spirit brings us into subjection so that we understand fully the things we need to overcome so that we can focus on that calling for incorruptibility to live forever. Running our race. He goes on to say, and behold, I come quickly. Quickly, this is Revelation 22. I come quickly, my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Eternal life is the free gift of God. It cannot be earned. It is given to you freely through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You cannot overcome sin, nor can I. Jesus Christ was the only one who overcame sin. You must overcome yourselves, your human nature, to become like he is. And when he comes back, the eternal life is a free gift. But through your works, God says, and James talks about faith without works is dead. The world doesn't want to hear about works because they think that you're earning salvation. You're not earning salvation. That's already been given. But there's a reward for those who overcome in this lifetime. He says, my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, that's not my words. That's coming directly from the Bible, from Jesus Christ. To give every man as his work shall be. So while we are here, those especially called in his first life, be given the opportunity, we are called to work and to overcome. And he's talking about that when you've won that race, you're going to get a prize. Every man's prize is different. It's according to the work that you that you have accomplished in this lifetime. Blessed are they that have washed their robes, it says, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of that city. That's showing that you have to qualify. It's there, it's already been given. Every person on the face of the earth will be given the opportunity. Every man, woman, and child is given the opportunity at whatever time frame God has chosen, whether it's the first resurrection or the second resurrection, to know about Jesus Christ and eternal life. That will be given to every man equally. It's what you do according to the works of the first fruits that Jesus Christ was going to give He's with his rewards when he comes. Now, the world don't want to hear that. And when, when I preach it, they're going to take this sermon. Someone's going to hear it. Says, Tom Carey's preaching is salvation by works, and I am not. Salvation is the gift of God, and from him alone it cannot be earned. Striving for the calling. Salvation is, let me reiterate, the free gift of God. It cannot be earned. It is a free gift from God. 
Your reward is determined according to your works. Now, that's, uh, that's proven again over and over and over again in the Bible. Matthew 6 says, verses 3 and 4, But when you do your alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that if you're doing things, God says you have to be working and no one really needs to know about it. That's between you and God. You had to be busy doing works. He goes on to say that your alms may be in secret and your father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Now that, that gives us a little hint that when we're working, it can't be like the Pharisees who would love to have the show in front of everybody. Your work needs to be quiet. It needs to be private. It needs to be between you and God. Others will see it and they'll recognize it, but you can't run around talking about what great things you're doing. And God says, if you do that, you've already got your reward. People pat you on the back and say, man, what a great job you're doing, man. And you run around and say, yep, I'm a pretty good guy, ain't I? <laughs> well, you already got your reward. God's saying that you're going to be working in such a manner that your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand's doing. Now, that's hard. That's part of the human nature we have to overcome. God says in the book of Luke, chapter 12, To much is given, much is required. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom much has committed much, of him they will ask more. And go back and read that scripture. It's in the book of Luke chapter 12 verse 48. If you're talented, you're gifted, you're qualified to do certain things, that's going to expect a lot more from you than someone who's not. Only you know your limitations and God knows. So it's between you to determine, with God's help, what you can and what you can't do. Striving for the calling, Matthew 25. I don't have the time to go there. But go back and read chapter 25 in, in, uh, in Luke 19. It talks about overcoming. And it talks about in the cities that are, are if you've been given talents, and you've got one talent and you overcame, and you get ten talents and you bring back. God talks about giving you ten cities to be ruler over ship. Do we realize that in this calling, God's calling us to be kings, to be priests, to be rulers in the world tomorrow. The opportunity to be able to rule over cities. If we can't overcome ourselves in this lifetime, how are we ever going to do that in the millennial reign? Not everyone's given the opportunity that you and I are given. Go back and read this. If you want, stop the DVD and come back to it later. Read Matthew 25. Read, read uh, Luke chapter 19. It talks about overcoming of what God expects for you and I. <clears throat> now I want to conclude this with a video clip. Yeah, as, as I was going through this, it came back to mind. I remember seeing this as a child. It was in the Ten Commandments. It's at the time when they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, when I talked to you just a little bit ago about the, the, the lightnings and the thunderings. And Charlton Heston and Cecil B. DeMille did a great job with this in, uh, in this little clip. So I want to conclude the sermon today to give you a chance to think about everything I've told you. And just take a moment, just relax. It's, uh, we took a couple of clips, it's about five minutes long, and then we'll come back and we'll conclude the, the message. From the burning bush, O oh Lord, you charged me to bring the people to this holy mountain to behold your glory and receive your law. What have I left undone?
covet anything that is thy neighbor. the finger of God. The light of God shines from you, Moses. Do not kneel to me, Joshua. These tablets of stone. The writing of God. His Ten Commandments. Joshua. Joshua, I charge you and strengthen you, for you shall go over Jordan to lead the people. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Merit, give me the books. Eleazar, set these five books in the Ark of the Covenant by the tablets of the Ten Commandments which the Lord restored unto us. Go, proclaim liberty throughout all the lands unto all the inhabitants thereof. the qualification process. What I did today is I wanted to go through to show you that Pentecost isn't a one-time event that took place 2,000 years ago. Pentecost pictures 7,000 years for mankind. During that process, it's showing us that God is reaching into this world and he's selecting those that he believes can be a part with him in his kingdom when he comes. He takes those selected individuals, he calls first fruits, part of that early harvest throughout that time of this first 6,000 years and then for that last 7,000 year, the millennial reign, to give them the opportunity to be with him, to rule and to reign for a thousand years. If you are looking at this DVD, and this is new to you, you need to go to God on your knees and ask him to help you understand what it is he has for you. Because you cannot come to this understanding. It is as foreign as trying to go out and to talk to someone in another nation in, in English. It is just a bunch of babbling that they cannot understand. If you're understanding it, then God has given you the opportunity for that first resurrection. Don't take it lightly. And for all of you who understand this, if you haven't been on fire, if you haven't been focused, if you haven't been striving to overcome, it's time to get on your knees before God and strive to overcome what it is that's keeping you from his kingdom. This is the only opportunity you will ever have, this life. Don't waste it. Be like Paul. Focus on that end time calling. Run your race and be there when that trumpet sounds with Jesus Christ at his coming.